greetings and salutations. Uh, my name is Don Emerson. I happen to be the director of the Southeast Asia program in the Walter Shorenstein Asia Pacific Research Center inside Stanford University, part, I should add, of the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies. So we have boxes within boxes here. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Greg Poling on a topic that he is uniquely suited to discuss, COVID-19 and the South China Sea. Greg is a senior fellow for Southeast Asia in <clears throat> the Center for Strategic Studies and Strategic and International Studies in Washington, DC. And he is even more to the point, the director of the Asia Maritime Transparency Initiative, AMTI. The key letter in AMTI is the letter T, transparency. We know that transparency is an issue with regard to COVID-19, the history of COVID-19. And it is certainly an urgent issue with regard to the South China Sea as the various claimants to different land features in the South China Sea defend their own interpretations of reality. Uh, I won't go further because Greg can do that so much more effectively than I can. But I do want to say that we all owe him a debt of gratitude. Any analyst or scholar or, or member of the public who is interested in the South China Sea can benefit if you just go onto the website and see what they have to offer and you will learn as I have learned when I have gone to the website. So Greg, with that introduction, again, I'm delighted to have you with us. I look forward to this discussion and the laptop, if that's what you're using, is yours. Thanks, Don. Uh, and thanks for everybody who took the time out to join today. I'm going to try to keep this to around 20 minutes so we can have a good Q&A. And I apologize in advance for the terrible background. This isn't my usual webcasting corner of the house, but I've been driven up here to our closet slash office by my daughter. Uh, so let me uh, start with some, you know, opening remarks. Why are we having this discussion? I think for a lot of folks who are watching Southeast Asia in particular these days, there's been a, a theme running through news coverage of late, which is uh, this debate. Is China taking advantage of the COVID-19 pandemic and the distraction of the region to further its goals in the South China Sea? I think that it's an understandable question. And certainly, uh, you know, the U.S. government is pushing that line. Um, Secretary Pompeo has said it more than once. We've had several statements from both state and DOD to this effect. Uh, it is fair to say that China's actions are being more uh, effective at the moment because of Southeast Asian distraction and that Chinese uh, diplomacy, the same wolf warrior diplomacy that we're seeing in other areas due to sensitivities in Beijing about criticism amid the pandemic is leading to a sense of, of greater nationalism, of greater chest thumping. But a lot of the actions that we're seeing on the water that have made the news aren't all that different than things we saw six months ago. Um, and I suspect not that different than what we'll see six months from now. So let me start, uh, share my screen here and jump into the presentation. I'll talk a bit about what the new status quo in the South China Sea was at the start of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic so we can get a sense of whether or not it's really changed. So, you know, everybody knows that China started building island bases in the South China Sea, or at least I assume if you've tuned into this webcast, you know that China started building island bases in the South China Sea around the end of 2013 and largely finished that by mid-2016, moved into what is often called the militarization phase, a lot of infrastructure, military and civilian, a lot of deployments to these islands. That was largely completed by early 2018. And we have been in, in a situation for the last two to three years in which Chinese forces operate through every inch of the Nine Dash Line, facilitated by these island bases, especially what we call the big three, which is Fiery Cross Reef, Subi Reef, the one that you're seeing here, and Mystic Reef. These are the real air and naval bases in the Spratly Islands. The tip of the spear is not really the PLA Navy, it's not the PLA Air Force, it is uh, two other forces, the Maritime Militia and the Coast Guard. China's goals are to control the South China Sea in scenarios short of war, to control the South China Sea in peacetime vis-a-vis -vis its Southeast Asian neighbors. And it doesn't use the Navy for that. The Navy is an implicit threat kept over the horizon. The first of these forces that's really ballooned is the militia. 
And uh, we spent about six months at the end of 2018 into early 2019 trying to get a handle on just how many militia boats we're talking about that operate in the South China Sea. I should say, when I say militia, this isn't a term of art. These are forces that are recognized, mandated by Chinese law, that regularly boast about their exploits on Chinese social media. Xi Jinping occasionally goes and pays them a visit and gets broadcast on state TV. This is an arm of the Chinese government, an arm that is specifically geared toward deniability. You put a bunch of recently retired PLA soldiers onto a fishing boat, they never fish, uh, but if they get in any trouble, you can always claim that they were independent actors. And because of the use of the new harbors in, in the Spratly Islands, what we saw over the course of 2017 to 2018 is an exponential increase in their numbers. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's more of them than existed before, though I suspect it is, but more that they are forward deployed in a way they weren't before. There are about 300 Chinese fishing boats that never fish, riding at anchor every single day at Mischief Reef and Subi Reef, the two biggest ones. And they get called up when an incident takes place, whether it's overfishing or over oil and gas or anything else. And their goal is basically to get in the way. They play a game of chicken, a high stakes game of chicken with other claimants. The most visible place this has been taking, uh, this has been playing out for the last year and a half has been uh, off the coast of the Philippines, biggest island in the Spratlys, D2. And we just ran a report a couple of months ago at ANTI to argue that even though this is largely faded from the press, it's still happening. There are a couple dozen up to a hundred boats operating just a couple miles off the coast of Pitu Island every single day. Now, there is some indication that that might have tampered off over the last months. Uh, it's, it's a little early to say, but for at least 15 months, this was a persistent militia deployment. This is a shot, uh, a commercial satellite image of Pitu Island at the, in December of 2018, when the Philippines decided to start upgrade work, long delayed upgrade work on that decrepit runway, which is falling into the ocean. Immediately after this photo, actually the same day this photo was taking place, we see 95 Chinese militia boats pour out of Subi Reef, which is just 12 and a half miles away. And they dropped anchor between Subi Reef and P2 Island, and they have been there, as I said, every day. They don't fish, they never have nets in the water, they never broadcast automatic identification system signals as they should. And we see the same activity around Vietnamese held islands, around other Philippine held islands. They showed up about 40 of them to support Chinese uh, survey activity off the coast of Vietnam last year. They showed up, they are showing up now off the coast of Malaysia. This is the most numerous of China's forces in the South China Sea. So any discussions we have about what China is doing has to start with the militia. It doesn't start with the PLA. The other force that's important to talk about is the Coast Guard, because when, you know, the militia's job is to get in the way and to harass, but when you actually need to interdict somebody, you need to call up an official government vessel. And the Chinese don't want to use the Navy, so they use the Coast Guard. Now, every class of Chinese Coast Guard vessel, with the exception of its big 12,000 ton boats, which it largely saves for the Japanese, operate on a day-to-day -day basis in the South China Sea. The big 12,000 tonners have been called on a couple of times when the Vietnamese or the Malaysians really tick them off, but for the most part, they're kept in the East China Sea. And it's important to recognize that China's Coast Guard, uh, in most cases, are bigger than the ships, than the Navy ships of its neighbors. Uh, at two of these classes that you're seeing here, the Jaljun WPS and the Jaldwan WPS, they have 76 millimeter guns. They're better armed than a lot of Navy ships in the region. So the term Whitehall versus Greyhall or Coast Guard versus Navy doesn't mean a whole lot if you're a Southeast Asian uh, Coast Guard staring down the Chinese Coast Guard. You don't feel a whole lot better to know that they are a technically civilian agency. And what they do most of the time is patrol day in and day out around underwater features or largely underwater features that have taken on special strategic significance or symbolic significance for China. One of those is Scarborough Shoal, which China seized from the Philippines in 2012. Another is Second Thomas Shoal, where the Philippines intentionally grounded uh, the Sierra Madre, one of its vessels in 1999, and still keeps a small contingent of Marines. And one that's of particular interest but doesn't get enough press is Luconia Shoals off the coast of Malaysia. This is an entirely underwater set of reefs that for everybody except for Beijing is not part of the Spratly Islands. But China does consider it uh, to be disputed, despite the fact there's no land there. And China has kept a Coast Guard ship at Luconia Shoals almost every single day for the last six or seven years, since late 2013. The Malaysians don't like to talk about this. The other thing that these vessels do, and what you're seeing here is a pretty standard patrol uh, pattern for one of the Coast Guard ships, is they are harassing oil and gas operations by the neighbors with increasing frequency. 
this became painfully obvious last year when we saw two different uh, run-ins on opposite sides of the South China Sea. So in March, at block SK-308 that you see there in purple, a shell affiliate operating out of Sarawak started drilling a new exploration well in a block that they've been operating in for years. And the regular China Coast Guard patrol at Luconia Shoals, which is nearby, peeled off and started harassing the rig and did so for at least two weeks. This is what that looks like. When I say that, that they play a high stakes game of chicken, again, I'm not using a term of art. That's actually what they do. Uh, the goal of the Chinese Coast Guard, just like the goal of the Chinese militia in most of these circumstances, is to not actually use force, but to create undue risk of collision for other actors, to make it so prohibitively risky and dangerous that it, is, it no longer makes sense for civilians, at least, to continue to operate. And so when they harass oil and gas operations, they don't actually harass the rigs for the most part. What they do is they harass the offshore supply vessels that keep those rigs operating. The green and yellow here are small supply vessels that traffic back and forth from the Malaysian coast. The red is the Chinese Coast Guard ship. This went on for 17 days, May 10th to May 27th. Here's what a pretty normal day looked like. You see uh, two of the offshore supply vessels leaving the site of the drilling operation when a Chinese Coast Guard ship comes in at high speed and whips around them. And this data is pulled from the AIS, the Automatic Identification System signals of these boats in real time. So it's not as if uh, we, we are taking guesses here. We watch as they come uh, remarkably close together. When the Malaysians didn't stop, the Chinese decided to pull the Coast Guard ship out and sent it to the other side of the South China Sea. The exact same Chinese Coast Guard ship, the 35111, was the first on scene in early July to harass the Hokuryu 5, which is a Japanese rig contracted by Russia's Rosneft to drill a new exploratory well in Block 61 off the coast of Vietnam. Again, a place where they have been pumping gas for years. And they engage in the exact same kind of high stakes chicken. The Vietnamese also didn't back down. And so that's when China trotted out a new uh, operation. Rather than try to get even riskier in the harassment of the rig and the offshore supply vessels, China escalated horizontally. It called out the Haiyang DG8, a state owned survey vessel and decided to send it up and down the coast of Vietnam, engaging in its own oil and gas exploration. The signal being, if Vietnam doesn't want to listen when it's told to stop something, fine. China will prove that these are in fact Chinese waters by surveying them right under Vietnam's nose. And this went on for four months. From July until the first week of October, the Haiyang DG8, along with a large contingent of Coast Guard and Chinese militia vessels, operated up and down the Vietnamese coast with you know, bracketing Vietnamese Coast Guard ships doing their best to get in the way. And luckily nobody bumped into each other. There was no violence. The Hakoryu 5 rig finally finished its work uh, in Block 62 in October and the Haiyang DJ-8 went back home. This is what the Haiyang DJ-8 survey looked like by the time it was done, all up and down the Vietnamese coast. So what have we seen since COVID-19 broke out that causes everybody to question whether or not the Chinese have gotten more aggressive? Well, the first big incident was the presence of Chinese fishing off Indonesia, which started in December and ran through January. And what wasn't very well reported is that the Chinese actually fish not just off the coast of Indonesia, but they started in the waters of Malaysia and Brunei. Uh, and they were accompanied by at least uh, a half dozen Chinese Coast Guard ships at all time. So it's not as if this was just the civilian actors who decided to go fishing in dangerous waters. This was a state sanctioned and organized fishing effort. Uh, meant to show the flag. I'll skip through the details. You'll say when they finally pulled out in January, it was only because President Joko Widodo of Indonesia personally flew to Greater Natuna Island, Natuna Besar, and made it such an international issue that Xi Jinping had to get on the phone and de-escalate. Uh, otherwise, that would have continued for who knows how long. And there's plenty of reports, including a New York Times story, that just a couple weeks later, the Chinese fishing boats were back as soon as Jokowi left. Then we move into a repeat of the oil and gas operations. Uh, later in December, the Malaysians contract the West Capella, uh, a drilling rig operated by Sea Drill, to start drilling in blocks ND4, ND2, and ND1 that you see north there, along with a handful of shell operations in SK-308 and SK-408, all of which came in for Chinese Coast Guard harassment, looking identical to the operations that I showed you from last year. The stuff in ND2 and ND1 really hit the press because 
the areas that that the V or that the Malaysians were drilling in were over the line in what's called the joint defined area. This is an area beyond the 200 nautical miles exclusive economic zone of Malaysia. That's actually also claimed by Vietnam. The two countries decided to issue a joint submission for their extended continental shelf claim in this area in 2009. And so the Vietnamese got a little ticked off when they found that the Malaysians were unilaterally drilling without even asking. And so you had uh, not just Chinese Coast Guard ships harassing offshore supply vessels from Malaysia. You also had, uh, looks like that video is broken. You also had these unnamed fishing vessels that you see up there. Those are actually Vietnamese militia themselves keeping watch. So by early January, there was a three country standoff going on off the coast of Malaysia in which the West Capella, the drilling ship that had been contracted and its offshore supply vessels were constantly running this cordon of patrolling Chinese Coast Guard ships while receiving constant warnings from the Vietnamese nearby to bugger off and go home. And in response, the Malaysians deployed as they had to with their Navy ships, the KD Jebat there is a missile frigate to operate back and forth for several months. That is still happening today. Uh, the West Capilla continues to drill. It started off in ND2, then ND1, then back to ND2. It is contracted to continue doing this at least through May. That's when the contract with sea drill ends. So we expect that the drilling ship will be there for another month playing this high stakes game of chicken. Here's what a pretty normal day looked like. You can see Chinese Coast Guard, uh, the Chinese fishing ship, which we presume is a maritime militia, and the supply vessels doing their best to stay out of the way. Now, this all took on, uh, this all became much more problematic when at the beginning of April, we saw the Chinese again following the methods that they had used off Vietnam last year, deploy the Haiyang DJ8 exact same survey ship in the exact same way. The Haiyang DJ8 along with the Coast Guard uh, patrol went down, started in the waters of Brunei actually, and then began a survey up and down the Malaysian coast. And the message again, just like it was for Vietnam last year was, if you don't want to back off when we send you every warning, then we're just going to go ahead and explore your waters under your nose. And we'll see how that plays for your domestic audience. And Malaysia hasn't been able to do much about it. This has also prompted an outcry from other regional states. The Vietnamese, despite not liking what the Malaysians are doing, uh, seem eager to play up the current tensions. Uh, the Filipinos have expressed some support and especially the US. So we had uh, a US State Department spokesperson come out almost every day and talk about this. When Secretary Pompeo met with the ASEAN uh, foreign ministers to discuss COVID-19 response a week ago, he brought up the South China Sea, in particular the standoff off Malaysia. The USS America uh, and its uh, two escorts, along with the Australian ship, did a patrol quite close to the West Capella, which we can talk about. They didn't stay very long, uh, and that didn't play very well in Malaysia. But the message was that the US is watching and that the Chinese better not use force. And the one other instance that I don't have any graphics to show off, but happened at almost the exact same time that the Haiyang DJ was headed out, actually just before, was the sinking of a Vietnamese fishing boat in the Paracels. So a Chinese Coast Guard ship under, let's say, unclear or contested circumstances rammed into and sunk a Vietnamese fishing boat about nine nautical miles south of Woody Island, which is the biggest of the Chinese held islands in the Paracels. And they pulled the fishers out of the water. They took them back to Woody Island under arrest. They also arrested two other Vietnamese fishing boats that came to help. And they eventually released everybody um, under unclear circumstances. Who knows what happened in the inter-party talks. The Vietnamese were furious, of course. The Chinese tried to play it off. They said that it was the Vietnamese fault. Their boat had veered into them. If you look at the pictures, it's quite clear that the Vietnamese fishing boat was rammed dead center. Uh, it didn't do the ramming. And this is also what, what really, you know, in combination with the high DJ aid survey is what prompted this uh, cry that the Chinese are doing more mid COVID-19. I would point out that Chinese interdiction, boarding, assault, even holding for ransom of Vietnamese fishermen in the Paracels is not new, and it's not that infrequent. The fact that one captain got overly aggressive and rammed somebody is problematic, but I don't think it signals some vast change in strategy from China. Rather, I think it is, again, part of the same creeping uh, assertion of control led by the Coast Guard and the Maritime Militia. Now, all of that said, right, that's, that's a whole lot of, of ways of me saying that China is continuing on this um, trajectory of ever greater control that seems to be heading toward a situation where the South China Sea is a Chinese lake. But we haven't seen any sharp change in that policy under COVID-19. If anything, it's, it's marched on unaffected by the pandemic in any way. What has changed, as I indicated earlier, 
is the response from the region and the response from Chinese diplomats. So the region seems uh, incensed at the idea that China would continue this amid a global pandemic that for a lot of folks in Southeast Asia is partially China's fault. I say that, recognize that a blanket statement here is difficult because of course there's a huge variety of opinions in Southeast Asia. In Vietnam, both the pandemic and what's happened in the South China Sea are unabashedly China's fault, if you ask the government or uh, the public. In places like uh, Thailand, Indonesia, the Philippines, there seems to be a sharp difference between what government and business elites are saying, which is largely uh, remaining, uh, well, keeping quiet on the South China Sea and officially buying China's narrative on, on COVID-19 versus the anger you hear on social media and in the press. In Malaysia, it's a bit of a black box, uh, largely because the government continues to try to pretend that what's happening off the coast isn't happening. But, you know, despite all of that divergence, the fact is that there is more of an outcry now than there was to the exact same kind of operations last year. And uh, China's response to those outcries, rather than trying to be conciliatory, trying to smooth things over, as Xi Jinping did with Jokowi earlier this year, has been to react with anger, with nationalism, with chest beating, uh, you know, part of what's again being uh, termed wolf warrior diplomacy the same thing i think that's leading chinese diplomats around the world to lash out over criticism about covid 19 criticism about its heavy-handed mass diplomacy criticism about human rights issues this is the same thing that seems to be leading chinese diplomats to double down on nationalism when it comes to the south china sea at a time when one might expect them to try to downplay these issues um, as they seek global leadership and i don't think that's going to change and it gets into this unhelpful tit for tat, right? Where a Chinese diplomat gets angry because of a criticism from Manila or Hanoi, which only makes Hanoi and Manila angrier. And I don't know how they deescalate because it seems pretty clear now that Vietnam is speaking to the international community. The Philippines is speaking to itself. China is speaking to its own domestic nationalists. It is not trying to actually answer the charges being laid against it. And so when you have one country like Vietnam trying to rally international support by calling China a bully and Chinese diplomats seeming to double down on that bullying for domestic consumption, uh, this is a recipe for heightened tensions. Now that's, uh, I think I've gone over. So I've hit 24 minutes. Why don't I wrap there? There's a whole lot of other things we can talk about, you know, the various administrative uh, declaration that China's made, which I, I see as part of this, this larger diplomacy. Uh, but I'm interested to just have a discussion. Good. Thank you very much, Greg. You did a wonderful job, I thought, uh, really going into detail, but maintaining the overall picture. <clears throat> Before I open it up to questions, we do have a couple of questions from, uh, uh, from participants in this webinar. Uh, let me just sort of uh, maybe bury the issue of COVID-19 in relation to the South China Sea. And when I say bury, because one possible answer, based on what you've said, is that it's irrelevant. Uh, there has been an argument, as you know, that China has taken advantage of the distraction of countries as they focus inward on their own health situations. And then the evidence in favor of that hypothesis would be that China has absolutely increased, amped up uh, its activities in the South China Sea. But I infer from what you said that that is not the case, that this has been going on for quite some time. Maybe there has been some intensification but that China is not sort of taking advantage of the distraction of the West. Uh, now, there are a couple of uh, possible connections, and I don't want to go through all of them. One of them is an economic connection. For example, insofar as there is cost associated with maintaining the land features that China controls in the South China Sea, and maintaining, of course, this massive Coast Guard and so forth, is it possible that COVID-19 will actually, in the long run, make it harder for China to manage to control the South China Sea and so far as that's what it's trying to do. Do you think there's any evidence in that regard or am I wrong? So I don't, I don't wanna be accused of, of making semantic arguments here, right? What China is doing in the South China Sea amid uh, a global pandemic, amid its neighbors you know, trying to grapple with this pandemic is outrageous and people should be scandalized. All I'm saying is that they haven't, you know, they haven't, uh, remarkably increase the tempo of operations. We haven't seen a huge surge in deployments. China is doing what China was committed to do before there was a pandemic. Now doing that while its neighbors 
are trying to deal with the pandemic, I think it's fair to argue that's taken advantage. It's not quite the same as saying that China is growing more assertive. China's just as assertive. Everybody else is just less capable of responding to that. And when you couple that with the diplomatic messaging, right, this, the chess something nationalism of, of the Jalijians of, of MOFA, it only, it makes it seem even more egregious than it already was. Uh, you know, how that plays long term, I, I don't know. I think this is largely wrapped up in how broader questions about perceptions of China are going to play out in the region, whether it's, um, you know, how people feel about China's early response to the pandemic, how people feel about the heavy handedness of China's uh, mass diplomacy, it's, it's provision of test kits and, and PPE, how you feel about a whole lot of things. And that's going to be different country to country. And like I said, it's going to be different public versus elite. We'll probably know more in six months. My guess is that it's going to reinforce sentiment of, among a majority of populations, at least in maritime Southeast Asia, that China is a bully who looks after itself first. And when given the opportunity to show regional leadership, chose a bay or thy neighbor approach instead. Uh, but the U.S. isn't necessarily going to benefit from that. The U.S. is also reinforcing Southeast Asia's worst assumptions about American policy, American leadership. Uh, and so I don't think the region is going to suddenly rush toward a U.S.-led coalition to push back against China in the South China Sea, because that doesn't seem to be much of an option at the moment. As far as whether or not the uh, pandemic makes it harder for China to control the South China Sea, I don't see any evidence of that. Um, the only direct argument one might make, and there is speculation about what the pandemic did to readiness within the force for China, whatever it did is probably already done. And it's hard to say, um, you know, the Chinese, the, the PLA Navy doesn't do a whole lot of international military engagement. So it's not like we would know if Chinese ships were full of sick soldiers, uh, unlike the U.S. Navy, which obviously you can't hide. You're doing calls all over the world. So does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let me shift to a couple of questions from the attendees. This first question is from Christopher Sharman. Uh, he says, my question relates to the code of conduct. This is obviously a different topic uh, mm -hmm. related. Greg recently argued in an interview that the COC is all but dead due to Chinese belligerence and coronavirus challenges. What does Greg see as the future for the COC? Is there a way forward? And then he adds a second question, which I guess maybe I should limit it to the first, but I won't. Do you anticipate Vietnam will file suit under Article 7? Another uh, got it. Yeah, no, having my own words thrown back at me like that, it's clear I'm getting more, uh, <laughs> I'm getting more strident as we're all locked in our homes. Uh, <laughs> I look, the, the COC in its current form is dead, or it's a shambling corpse. I don't, I don't know that the... the the, both the process and the substance are deeply problematic, meaning that the substance of the last draft, the one approved after the first reading in Thailand, is, to put it bluntly, a joke. Um, you know, it is 11 different drafts that have been copied and pasted into a single Word document, and then they deleted the redundant language. They haven't actually negotiated anything. There have been no discussion on any of the really substantive issues. The documents put forward by the most forward-leaning Southeast Asian parties, like the Philippines and Malaysia, not just Vietnam, are basically rehashes of the positions they put forward in 1998, the first time they tried this. And the Chinese position is identical to the position China put forward in 1998. And so on the process side, now we are watching a rehash of arguments that ASEAN had and lost over 20 years ago, except now China has even more leverage. Uh, in that, not only is it more powerful, but it also has Cambodia to make sure that nothing ever goes through. So I don't see any possibility that the code of conduct concludes in two years. Uh, I don't see any in inclination by Vietnam to agree to a bad code of conduct, which is the only one on the table. And so Vietnam's not going to push for any progress this year as chair. Uh, even if the process hadn't been derailed by the cancellation of half the ASEAN calendar this year by the pandemic. Uh, the choices are no code of conduct or a bad code of conduct. That's the only thing on the table. Now, that doesn't mean that there's no possibility. It just means that the possibilities for diplomatic progress are going to have to happen outside of the code of conduct process, which they always should have. Uh, the code of conduct is not set up to manage the disputes. 
There is no effort to negotiate details of fisheries management or oil and gas resources, Coast Guard to Coast Guard cooperation, none of that. The code of conduct is meant to be a very broad set of principles, so broad that they're not going to make a difference even if they were legally binding. Either way, you have to have some other parallel process that involves just the claimants, gets the non-claimants out of the room so that people can have real discussions about fisheries management before it's too late, which it probably already is. Talks about oil and gas cooperation before it's too late, which, you know, for the Philippines, it already is when it comes to Reed Bank. Those can, I don't care if those happen in parallel with the code of conduct. If, if ASEAN has invested so much uh, of its, you know, uh, so much of its credibility in this that it can't let it go, fine. Have the code of conduct talks, sign a document that doesn't say anything, call it legally binding, and add on, we, the members of ASEAN and China, endorse these ongoing discussions between the claimants. That's fine. But in either case, the real discussions will happen among the claimants. Uh, now, the one effort to actually do this was at the end of 2018, uh, I'm sorry, the end of 2017, I guess, the, the ASEAN uh, meeting in Manila, there was an announcement of a decade of coastal and environmental cooperation in the South China Sea, in which ASEAN and China agreed to follow up with concrete discussions on fisheries management and marine conservation in the South China Sea. And the Thais refused to take up the issue during their chairmanship. Uh, so far, there has been zero discussion on that two and a half years later. So the only actual effort to talk about fisheries has gone nowhere. As, as far as the Vietnamese, no, I don't. There's, again, a lot of chatter about whether or not Vietnam will pursue uh, arbitration under Article 7, which is a compulsory dispute settlement mechanism that the Philippines use against China. You know, I was in Da Nang uh, at the annual Diplomat Academy of Vietnam South Tennessee Conference in 2014, in the middle of the Haiyang Shiryu 981 standoff, the last time Vietnam really had this debate, and it went nowhere. And then I was in Hanoi last year in the middle of the standoff with the Haiyang DJ8, in which it was clear that this was the number one topic on Vietnamese leaders' minds when it came to the South China Sea. They had three different uh, presidents and vice presidents of ITLOS, the International Community of the Wall Sea, there at the conference. And yet it, it hasn't happened yet. Now, I think there's a lot of people in Vietnam who would like it to happen, but look, Vietnam's dealing with an ASEAN chairmanship, a seat on the UN Security Council, and it's planning a party conference, Congress for next year. A party Congress at which the guy who currently is the most powerful leader in, I don't know, 25 years in Vietnam is going to have to step down. I don't see them picking a big fight like this, um, unless Beijing really pushes them over the edge. If you see dead Vietnamese mariners, maybe, maybe that changes things. Yeah, if I could comment, I think one interesting possibility is that if China develops the kind of strength that would enable it to actually dictate the terms of a COC, and if at the same time, for various reasons that we could go into, and you've touched on some of them, the Southeast Asian claimants essentially, you know, accept reality uh, and, you know, basically are, are unwilling to maintain uh, the kind of position that you're suggesting might actually be stimulated by the anger now on both sides. Is it not conceivable that there could be a COC that would be so anodyne and it wouldn't necessarily reach the conclusion, obviously it's not supposed to be about sovereignty issues anyway, uh, that, you know, China should have free reign in the South China Sea, but that it would paper over the disagreements and therefore really prolong the problem. Yeah, I think that's exactly what will happen. Um, if China has its way, China's goal is to do one of two things. I have to keep ASEAN talking forever while it establishes de facto control of all the resources of the South China Sea, or get ASEAN to sign a code of conduct that is so useless, so bland, that it will constrain ASEAN because of ASEAN's own internal norms, but not constrain China in either way. In any way. Either way, China wins. And that will so infuriate the Vietnamese that they might finally decide to pursue different paths. But it might be too late by then. I, the one other thing that I think could upset this is if any other claimant really goes for a joint development uh, discussion, one that, that makes Hanoi in particular believe that the game's going to get away from it. I think a lot of people were worried about the Philippines. I was never that worried because I don't think Duterte ever cared enough about the details to get uh, the joint MOU with China through. And that seems now to be indefinitely stuck. But the Malaysians worry me. Um, Petronas is never going to return to these wells to produce. And if, Viet if, if the new reality is that 
no offshore exploration can happen off the coast of Malaysia without China's permission, there's going to be a whole lot of Malaysian government officials willing to hold their nose and sign a joint development deal with CNUC sovereignty or no. We've got a lot of questions, so we're going to try to keep the answers uh, brief here. Uh, Sarah Maxim wonders whether the low price of oil uh, will actually reduce the motivation in Beijing to develop the hydrocarbon resources in the South China Sea. Yeah, I assume so. Um, I mean, the, the, the funny thing about the South China Sea hydrocarbons is that with the exception of gas production off Borneo for Malaysia and some of the gas production like the Nam Khan San field that, that Rosneft operates off Southeast Vietnam, there's really nothing of proven commercial value. Uh, Reed Bank is the obvious exception, but the, the Filipinos have already waited so long that at this point it's impossible to see how they can produce commercially from Reed Bank. Uh, this is a argument about joint development that'll never happen. For the Chinese, I mean, their objections, whether it's to Vietnam or Malaysia, is to them developing these resources. Not because China wants them, but because it doesn't want anybody else to have them. China will not run a thousand mile pipeline from the coast of Malaysia to China, which is the only way that you can produce the gas commercially. You're not going to make LNG out there and think you can sell it commercially. There's almost no oil. So it's hard to see how any Chinese company can turn a profit. This is only of value to the closest coastal state. Okay, good. An anonymous at attendee wonders, do you think China has the military capacity to take the South China Sea by force, which of course raises the question of what would that even mean? Hmm. I, mean I remember years ago arguing at CNA in Washington, right, the Center for Naval Analyses, <clears throat> with a former naval officer who told me that it is impossible to control water. You can control land, but you can't control water. So does it even make any sense to think that China could take the South China Sea by force? Yeah. I guess it depends on, like you said, what you mean here. I mean, can China take the physical land features? Obviously, um, without too much trouble. Uh, it does, wouldn't even have to use force. It could starve most of those uh, garrisons out if it really wanted to, which is why the Vietnamese have invested so much on helipads over the last few years to make sure they can resupply. They learned the lesson the last time the Chinese tried to starve the Filipinos out of the Sierra Madre, which was in 2014. Controlling the sea space is a different question. I mean, China, even China can't be everywhere all the time, but that's not really the goal. If the goal is to establish control in peacetime, all China needs to do is make it prohibitively risky, prohibitively dangerous for civilian operations to move forward. And it's pretty close to that already. You don't have to stop every fisherman. You just have to make it so damn dangerous to be a fisherman without Chinese permission that everybody moves on. That's first going to be seen in the oil and gas sector. We are already to a point where I don't think it I don't think it's a stretch to believe that in the next couple of years, Vietnam is going to be unable to find any foreign investor for offshore oil and gas operations, especially if Exxon pulls out of the blue oil field, which it seems likely to do. And then the same happens to Malaysia, right? What happens if Shell divests uh, from its operations and Petronas can't find any other partners? China doesn't have to control all the water. It just has to make sure that nobody else is willing to try to contest it. Good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Tom Finger asks the question, should countries outside of the region, outside of Southeast Asia, care more about what is happening there than the regional states themselves? If so, why? This is an argument you hear commonly on the part of those who say, look, you know, is this really in the interest of the United States? Yeah. Uh, um, way, these are little pieces of land. Uh, we shouldn't care more. Sometimes it seems like outside states do. Um, and again, this is not universal, but in the case of Malaysia, absolutely. A lot of foreign states seem to care more about Malaysia's sovereign rights than Malaysia does, and care more about Philippine sovereign rights than the current president of the Philippines does. But for, for the, whether it's the US or Australia or Japan or the UK or France, any of the, the numerous states who voice uh, criticism of China's activities here, it's not about doing this for the Southeast Asian states. Yes, I mean, we do have a problem with them getting kicked around just because uh, China has the bigger boats. There are also international stakes here that 
are independent of the Southeast Asian. So if China gets to claim a thousand nautical miles of water just because it said so, that undermines the entire notion of international rule of law. Either the rules apply to everybody or they apply to nobody. And if China can do this in the South China Sea, how long before the Russians demand absurd rights in the Arctic or Iran in the Persian Gulf or on and on and on? Why would anybody agree to bind themselves to unclose if it doesn't apply to the world's second largest power? Um, you know, same goes for regional stability and, and the questions around use of force. Either it's not okay to use force to resolve a territorial dispute or it is. And I don't, you know, us condemning China for threatening force is not contingent on the willingness of Malaysia to speak up for itself. Yeah, I guess that assumes a kind of global role for the United States, uh, that our interest is more than just kind of defending our own country. But we, we share an interest with other countries and we may worry about their future more than they worry about it themselves. But then the question is whether the shift in relative balance of power between China and the United States, not to mention the rise of Europe and, you know, then we get into Donald Trump and, you know, the inwardness of American politics in some respects at the moment, you know, it, it does raise a question as are we really responsible or not? And I think a key issue here is the role of international law. Uh, and I wonder if you could comment um, to the extent that there is a solution to the South China Sea. Would you say that recourse to international law, whether it's by Vietnam or some other uh, entity that's involved in the, in the dispute, is a, is, is a recipe for disaster? Because it, it means endless delay to try to get a ruling. I mean, how many years did it take for the Philippines to get its ruling? And a number of questions are of the following character that it's too late. Right. It's over. China controls it. Get used to it. Now, I know that's kind of, it runs against the grain of your uh, discussion to this point, but how would you respond to that? So, I don't want to confuse this with arguments about the role of, you know, the United States as global policemen or anything like that. This is not, the U.S. does not care who owns what rock or reef in the South China Sea. It's not for us to decide if the Philippines wants to throw in the towel on the Kalyan Islands tomorrow in exchange for Chinese investment, fine. That's Manila's choice. Manila or KL or Jakarta or Hanoi do not have the rights to throw in the towel on the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. It's not for them to decide. China's claims are illegal, period. Uh, and it is not, you know, the US is not wading into somebody else's fight by saying that we are not gonna recognize a Chinese claim to a thousand miles of water. Now, if you believe, as some folks in the White House now might believe, that international law has no role in maintaining our national security or global peace and stability, then you probably don't care about that argument. I am not in that camp. I believe that the reason that well, I shouldn't say I believe, the evidence is pretty overwhelming that the reason that we've seen an unprecedented period of human prosperity and safety is because of a system of international rules and norms established after World War II, uh, which are deeply imperfect. But there are basic principles behind them, and one of them is the co-equality of all states, big or small. Now, if you get to a place where those rules no longer apply in Asia, right, that there is some kind of invisible curtain across the Pacific in which international rules cease to apply, the United States is less safe in that world. And the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea is arguably the most universally accepted and respected piece of international legislation since the UN Charter. So I think it is entirely within the right of not just the US, but every sovereign state to defend it anywhere, not just off our own shores. Okay. I'm trying to get that off my soapbox, sorry. No, 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 I mean, you know, normally in this kind of a conversation, someone at this point, as one person did, uh, uh, you know, in the questions that I'm, that I'm reading as they come in, point out that the United States, of course, has not uh, signed uh, the law of the sea, UNCLOS. So, you know, we, but rather than take it in that direction, let me, let me offer some kind of specific, a number of the questions are, what should the United States do, okay? And if legal redress, you know, not that that's necessarily a bad idea in principle, the problem is that it is a principle rather than a practice that one could have some effect on in a short time frame, right? So uh, 
But what about this? Um, <clears throat> the United States has maintained traditionally that it does not back any of the claimants' positions. But what if the United States said, you know, uh, we're looking there at, let's say, Scarborough Shoal, for example. Actually, Scarborough Shoal really does belong to the Philippines. Uh, and we're prepared to back that up. Now, the second part of what I just said, we're prepared to back that up, obviously points in a dangerous direction. Or what if the United States sent an American warship just off Second Thomas Shoal to provide cover for the Philippines to be able to replenish the supplies and maintain a deteriorating uh, station uh, that they have uh, in, the, in the form of the Sierra Madre, which of course is you know, you know, sinking into the ocean and badly needs repair and to challenge China to continue to interrupt that supply chain into uh, the ship. I mean, I, it, would these kinds of steps be militaristic? And here we get to the critical question of how likely is a war to be generated in the South China Sea, a war that everyone would regret. Yeah. There's, a, there's a lot to unpack in that. And let, let me start with this notion of US neutrality um, because it's a useful, uh, bludgeon that, that Beijing likes, no U.S. official has ever said that the United States is neutral when it comes to claims in the South China Sea. Uh, going all the way back to 1938, uh, when the Japanese decided to claim the Shinan Gunto, the U.S. position has always been that the only basis for claims is the existing international law of that time, which is why we objected to Japan's claims. Not because we were siding with France or China on who actually owned them, we just knew the Japanese didn't. In the same way, the U.S. does not know who owns the Spratly Islands or the Paracels. The U.S. does not take a position there. The U.S. does very much take a position on maritime claims. The U.S. does reject the Nine Dash Line. The U.S. has endorsed the 2016 Arbitral Award. The U.S. is not going to get into a fight over who owns C2 Island. If you ask uh, who owns Second Thomas Shoal, I think U.S. you know State Department lawyers are getting very uncomfortable and try to dodge, but the logical conclusion of U.S. positions is that the Philippines own second Thomas Shoal because it's underwater and therefore part of the Philippine continental shelf. Scarborough Shoal makes U.S. lawyers even more uncomfortable because in the 1930s, multiple U.S. cabinet officials said Scarborough Shoal belongs to the United States. So obviously it became part of the Republic of Philippines in 1946. Uh, the U.S. neutrality on Scarborough Shoal didn't exist until 2012. So that's a long way of saying, you know, the U.S. should be standing on kind of first principles here, principles that have been maintained since the 1930s, which is international law is the only way to resolve these disputes without the use of force. We will not wade into messy questions of historical sovereignty, but we will stand on the law. And the law says that the Philippines gets an easy and kind of shelf, and so does Malaysia, and so does Vietnam, and the islands only get a 12-mile territorial sea. And China has no right to the waters other than that. Uh, a question regarding Brunei. Uh, we know that uh, Brunei will replace Vietnam as chair of ASEAN. And Cambodia will replace Brunei, looking farther down the road. Now, the foreign policies of Brunei and Cambodia are not exactly in defense of the strategic autonomy of Southeast Asia vis-a-vis -vis China. I mean, you could argue that Cambodia is a client state and Brunei, which is obviously a small state and has a very small claim in the South China Sea, has not shown itself willing to challenge China. So how does American policy, and for that matter, uh, the Southeast Asians who are directly interested, cope with the possibility that China in the years to come will have support within ASEAN that will continue to make any kind of meaningful COC impossible and thus promote the acceptance of what you might call strategic fatalism. It's mm -hmm. fatalistic because China's got it. You know, we've got to get used to that. But it's strategic insofar as accepting that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't try to extract from China at least some measure of compensation for your own fatalism. Or does that make any sense? No, it does. Um, I think part of it comes back to the point I made about ASEAN and the inability of any code of conduct to effectively manage the South China Sea if it emerges from within ASEAN. I think the U.S. is right to support ASEAN centrality. I think ASEAN is the only seed you really have if you want to build up strong regional architecture. 
it is not up to the task of the South China Sea. It has been failing abysmally for a decade. Uh, if you continue to insist that ASEAN must be the body that resolves the South China Sea, you're going to do two things. You're going to turn the South China Sea into a Chinese lake, and you are going to fracture ASEAN. Uh, because how long do we all think Hanoi is going to sit there and watch its supposed ASEAN member state side with Beijing over it, over and over and over? So if you support ASEAN centrality, you should support the idea of getting the South China Sea out of ASEAN. I also point out that the South China Sea is the only regional security issue on which ASEAN centrality takes this form. Whether it's the Sulu Sea patrols, the Strait of Malacca patrols, the Mekong River Commission, you know, the Prey of Ahir dispute, no other issue in Southeast Asia was it considered blasphemy to talk about member states taking up among themselves outside of the ASEAN context. It's only this issue on which the idea of ASEAN centrality has become a talisman and nobody can go against it. So the US position should be we support ASEAN. We support the code of conduct talk. That's what ASEAN wants to do. But we should put a lot more effort into encouraging and then supporting other efforts. And we should also be messaging to other South Asian claimants that if you want to take this outside the region altogether, you want to take this to the UN, if a future more rational Philippine government wants to call for non-binding resolutions in the UN, we'll support you. It worked with us and Nicaraguans did it for almost 10 years and finally got us to buckle after we lost the ICJ decision. So yeah, there are a lot of other efforts that can take place outside of the ASEAN context. We have a couple of questions with regard to the domestic situation inside China, as it might affect Chinese policy with regard to the South China Sea. One uh, <coughs> comment from Eve Tiebergen suggests that one might consider the possibility that this is not a top-down effort by the leadership of China, from Xi Jinping directly down you know, to the Coast Guard vessels in the South China Sea, but rather uh, it's a local effort on the part of particular commanders within the military and presumably their civilian supporters who want to take a hard line in the South China Sea and that we shouldn't exaggerate the extent to which this really reflects, you know, a top-down decision. Related to that is an argument that also came up in one of the questions, which is that nationalism, you know, is a tiger that it's hard to ride. Uh, there's too much risk. That is to say, if uh, Xi Jinping, in this case, uh, suddenly decided to give way on negotiations of a South, you know, whether it's the COC, uh, to reduce the harassment, for example, in uh, the South China Sea, he can't afford to do that because he's riding the tiger. And the tiger of domestic Chinese nationalism is, you know, so intense that he could be victimized, especially at a time when COVID-19 is already tending to undercut perhaps some of the legitimacy that he might otherwise enjoy. So you know, I could go on, but what kind of internal dynamics in China do you think might, might play over into Chinese policy and behavior in the South China Sea? There's a seed of truth in each of those points, but I think we can also overstate them, and we often do. So, you know, nobody in Zhongnanhai is calling the daily shots in the South China Sea. Xi Jinping is not directing Coast Guard ships to ram Vietnamese fishing boats on a ship by ship basis. What Beijing has done is establish a set of mandates that have created a policy environment in which local actors are encouraged to go forth and show the flag and defend sovereignty and harass the neighbors. And the only time leadership in Beijing gets involved directly is when it becomes a crisis. So when Jokowi is calling you on the phone, that's when Xi Jinping gets involved. But saying that, I mean, that is saying that Beijing has delegated the actual implementation of this policy on a day-to-day -day basis to regional actors. It is not the same as saying that those regional actors can go out and exceed their orders because they cannot. Uh, I am not aware of anybody being punished for being too aggressive in the South China Sea. No Chinese leader has said, we're very sorry that he, things got out of hand. No, they've always doubled down on defending what they've done. Uh, you know, they doubled down very much on the idea of historic fishing rights off Natuna uh, earlier this year. The, you know, Xi Jinping has placed the South China Sea at the heart of the China dream, the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. It is one of those things on which he has staked his credibility as a leader and the credibility of the party more generally, uh, which is why we have largely seen 
actors within the training system feel more empowered to be aggressive since she took office. He is at the heart of this. And as long as he's in power, you're not going to see a suddenly more cuddly, uh, accommodative China in the South China Sea. So it's not, you can't point to local actors and say, well, it's that commander who's a bad apple. No, that commander is doing exactly what Zhang Nanhai has told him he should be doing. Second, on the nationalism front, yeah, there is some truth to this. Uh, you know, I, 10 years ago, I had a meeting. Uh, I was in a roundtable with officials from a couple of different Chinese ministries, let's say, all of whom off the record agreed that the nine dash line was inconsistent with international law. And all of whom said, we're working real hard to re-envision the nine dash line so that it will be consistent with international law based on the notion of, of islands, rocks and relevant waters. But we need some time to sell this up to the leadership and also to sell it down to the public. Well, and then a year later, Xi Jinping became the party secretary and president, and, and you don't hear that kind of talk anymore. But the point is, yes, there is, there is a real inability to go too far because of the fear of public backlash, especially at a time like this, where the party is circling the wagons because they're so worried about the way COVID-19 will blow back on their credibility. All of that said, who created this nationalism? Who fueled it? Who came up with this fairy tale of ancient historic rights? The Chinese leadership. There was no such thing as historic rights in China's claims until the 1990s, when it became one of great many patriotic, you know, bits of nonsense trotted out after Tiananmen and included in the patriotic education campaign. If Chinese school children weren't taught that James Shoal was the southernmost piece of Chinese territory, maybe they wouldn't grow up to demand greater assertiveness from their leaders. So it is very self-serving for Chinese leaders to say, we can't dial back in the South China Sea because the public demands it of us, and then turn around and encourage the public to do exactly that. A couple of questions also uh, asked about actors in relation to the South China Sea that might have a motivation to change their policy. Uh, Taiwan is an element in the equation that is rarely discussed in this context, so I'm grateful to Maria Artusti for raising this. For example, is it possible, given that on the one hand, as we all know, Taiwan reproduces technically or formally China's claim with regard to the South China Sea. And we could get into, uh, well, we could get into those details, but essentially, is it possible that Taiwan will begin to create some daylight between its position and China's position, which obviously would encourage opposition to China's position on the part of other countries. And I assume that the United States would be delighted, in fact, I would think so, apart from the risks of war in the Straits of Taiwan, which of course might not be negligible. What about that prospect? And then second, there's, there's a question with regard to Duterte. Um, one argument is that Duterte really doesn't care about foreign policy. He cares about infrastructure, you know, and killing people who might be dealing drugs, right? Sort of a domestic kind of orientation. Um, is there any chance that, that the difference between the deep state in the Philippines, which in my opinion, feel free to disagree, is actually not sympathetic at all to China and Duterte, given his extraordinary personality, that, that, that the Duterte factor could be overcome either from within or we simply wait uh, until he's no longer president? Are there dynamics of that kind at work? I mean, the third the third one, which was also mentioned, is Indonesia. You know, the lack of leadership of ASEAN that Indonesia has generated under Jokowi illustrates the same kind of thing. Not that Jokowi is Duterte, but his focus is on moving goods more rapidly, right, from Aceh to Papua, right? He's not all that interested in foreign policy. Is there any chance that there could be a development in that direction that would impact the ability of the Southeast Asian states to stand up to China? Yeah, so the Taiwan issue is a tough nut to crack. Um, I mean, not just for us analysts, but for Taiwanese leaders. Um, it is worth noting that yes, the, you know, the U-shaped line obviously was a Republic of China invention. When it comes to the claims to land features and even underwater features, Taipei's claim is identical to Beijing's. When it comes to the interpretation of the nine dash line, it's not. Um, Taiwanese leaders, the Taiwanese government very explicitly rejected the notion of historic rights in the 1990s, did not write it into its domestic laws. And so there is a lot, it is much easier to imagine Taiwanese leaders bringing their claims into conformity with international law than it is China's. Uh, it is also, I think, much harder for Taiwanese leaders to actually 
sell the idea that all of the claims are ancient and indisputable and blah, 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 because everybody can, you know, it, it is a much more free discussion in Taipei. There is much more disagreement when you talk to academics. Um, and so you would think that there's a lot more daylight there and that this issue might be taken up by a, a Taiwanese leader, you know, maybe President Tsai, if they decide that they need to put more daylight between them and Beijing. That said, it's hard to see what the benefits are. I mean, I can see why the U.S. wants this, why the Japanese would want this, why ASEAN states would want this. Why would a Taiwanese leader want to do this? It's not as if ASEAN states are suddenly going to say, okay, you can join the Code of Conduct negotiations. It's not as if it's going to get diplomatic recognition from Southeast Asian states for this. What it is going to get is diplomatically uh, isolated even more by Beijing. It's going to get a whole new set of pressure campaigns. It might even get more overt Chinese aggression. If you imagine that a Taiwanese leader came out and publicly said the 1947 U-shaped line map was only ever meant to be a claim to the islands. It was never a claim to waters and therefore everything Beijing says since then is a fairy tale. Mm. There is going to be very little benefit to that Taiwanese leader and a whole lot of potential danger. So you know, given that Taiwan is the only state in this discussion who faces a day in and day out threat of amphibious invasion from China, I don't expect that the South China Sea is ever going to be high enough on the priority list for them to take that step. Um, unless, now I will say unless Beijing's pressure tactics and isolation campaigns become so egregious, Taiwan's international space shrinks so much that a leader decides that he, they have nothing left to lose that Beijing's gonna punish them, you know, threaten them existentially, no matter what. And so why not try this? But we're not there yet. Um, let me quickly divert to Indonesia. Indonesia, I, would, I wish people would stop <laughs> with the notion that Indonesia is somehow either a major player or gonna be the savior of the South China Sea. <laughs> Indonesian officials don't care about the South China Sea. They don't, other than fishing rights in their very narrow slice of it, Indonesian, even under SBY, Indonesian governments had went out of their way to try to remain uninvolved in the broader South China Sea debate. As long as China can maintain some, I don't know, some fiction that it's respecting Indonesian rights, Jakarta is going to stay on the sidelines. Now, if there is a big regional effort to do something about this, if you imagine a scenario in which, you know, the Vietnamese, the Filipinos, the Malaysians all decide to launch fisheries talks together, Indonesia is going to demand to be in the room, so it's not left out, but it's not going to lead that effort. The effort, if it happens, will be led by Vietnam and the Philippines. Those are the two necessary states. They're the only two that might get it done. Uh, and everybody else will follow. And then as far as the Philippines, look, um, the only reasonable thing to assume is that Duterte will remain in office until 2022 and that he will continue to do things against the interests of both, against the national security interests of both the Philippines and the United States. And so the goal should be what, how do you tread water for the next two years? What can you salvage? And then how do you build it back after 2022? Whoever comes into office, I suspect is going to be much less pro-China and much less anti-American, even if it's Sarah Duterte. She's going to have to come into office and political realities will dictate that she tack back toward the center and say, look, my daddy tried his best, but Beijing didn't reciprocate. And so we're going to have to take a more independent policy. So there's a spectrum on how pro-American, anti-Chinese that new leader is going to be, but they're certainly not going to be uh, as anti-American and pro-Chinese as Duterte is now. I think we're going to have to end shortly, but I can't resist uh, before we do, because we do have a little flexibility. Um, and my apologies to anybody who thinks we've already gone too long. Um, you mentioned the Philippines and Vietnam, and it seems to me that's an appropriate point uh, on which to close the conversation. Um, surely, if we look at the candidates for an initiative that would counterbalance China, those two are front and center. You've almost said this in terms of their, their positions, their ability. If we can just take care of the Duterte problem, which of course remains a serious problem, but I mean, Lorenzana and the people who are in charge, as it were, of, of the security of the Philippines have very different views. And if they were to come to power, it might be possible for a joint initiative, a bilateral initiative between Hanoi and Manila, 
to actually have some effect in terms of counterbalancing uh, China. Now, there are lots of ways of imagining what that initiative could be. And of course, this is wishful thinking on my part because you know there's no clear indication that this is likely to happen anytime soon, especially because of the Duterte problem. But uh, imagine this, uh, and this is a conversation that you and I have had before, so forgive me if uh, you've already heard it, which you have. Um, I, you know, maybe this is completely naive on my part, but what if the two countries got together, the Philippines and Vietnam, at some future time, and made the following statement, no single country should control the South China Sea, period. And they signed that statement. Remember what happened to the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation when it was developed by ASEAN, and now there are 30, 35 different countries around the world that have signed it. Brazil, for example, has signed the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation in Southeast Asia, right? And so the idea would be a statement, no kind of simple statement, no country should control the South China Sea, signed by these two countries, which would then be open for China to sign, for Japan to sign, Australia, India, the United States, Nigeria, right? To do the same kind of thing, to make it a kind of a global position. Now, I realize the immediate counter argument of this is completely naive, you know, it's typical of an academic who exaggerates the value of words, <laughs> right? That's an occupational hazard. So feel free to say this is a ridiculous idea, but I would appreciate your comment. I think any statement to that effect would be instantly supported by Beijing because China will maintain that it does not seek control of the South China Sea. This is the problem with ASEAN, you know, you, the problem with using diplomatic speak in this context, um, China will maintain that it does not violate international law in the South China Sea. It'll maintain that it's never violated the 2002 DOC in the South China Sea. What you need is an actual effort to have a concrete negotiation on something. I would argue fisheries is the obvious place to start before it's too late. Something that can prove that progress is possible. And that's not going to be the COC. If you can imagine, say, a meeting between Philippines, Vietnam, and Malaysia, in which they decide to table a real fisheries management mechanism um, for negotiation with China, puts enormous pressure on the Chinese to respond. Because if the Chinese say, no, we won't do it, then they're saying that they have no interest in you know, peacefully and legally resolving this. Uh, it's, you know, it, it, you could find ways that it would actually work. There's nothing in China's historic rights. There's nothing in Chinese law that prevents Beijing from making this compromise if China decides it's in its interest. You need to start somewhere. And the ridiculous thing now is that nobody's allowed to have any negotiations until the COC is concluded. Because if you have any discussions outside of the COC, then a bunch of other ASEAN states, mostly non-claimants, will scream, you're violating ASEAN centrality. Um, and so you're handcuffed. And guess what? By the time the COC negotiations wrap up with a useless agreement, the fish are all going to be dead. And it's going to be too late to extract your oil and gas. And so you're going to, you know, you figure, well, I guess the Chinese have already won by default. Well, you know, <clears throat> that's exactly the answer I got in the State Department when I raised the possibility of the statement, no single country should control the South China Sea. The first thing they said was, well, you know, Professor Emerson, that's exactly what China would say. Yeah, we don't want to control the South China Sea. Well, but let me, let, let me just respond briefly to that argument. First of all, it would not be just China that would be at, at, at issue here. If countries in Southeast Asia and around the world you know, dozens of countries agree that no country should control the South China Sea, and China does as well, but they're outnumbered by a range of countries that really think that China may actually want to and be in the process of controlling the South China Sea. And then the issue of what control means becomes a live issue on the table. It can be interpreted in many different ways after all, right? It's not, a, it's not a, an on-off switch. It's not black or white. And so you generate, now maybe again, this is the academic faith in discourse as having some kind of meaning beyond just you know, words on a screen. But I can imagine a shift in the debate that would actually put China on the spot, precisely because having signed it, are they now hypocritical in what they do compared to their commitment? To, and then we would ask them, well, what do you mean by, by control, right? Look what you're doing in the South China Sea. You're intimidating people. You're preventing Southeast Asian uh, nations from engaging in resource development and so forth. 
Uh, no, no. I mean, you do want to control the South China Sea. And that debate actually could increase the number of countries that are really on the side of those that really are upset by what China is doing. But again, I may be completely naive. And uh, perhaps that's a conversation we should have just the two of us. <laughs> well, Don, what we need is anything, any debate that shines a light on the excessiveness and absurdity of Chinese claims and actions and rallies international support. The last time we had this was second half of 2015 through the first half of 2016, as the Aquino government backed by Tokyo and Washington went on its international PR blitz ahead of the ruling. And it worked, right? They got all of Europe. They got 60 some states in the international community signing on the statements, uh, endorsing the ruling. And then that all evaporated. So I, I'm somewhat agnostic about exactly who has to be first mover here and what exactly it takes. I think the Vietnamese are the most likely given current political realities, mm -hmm. but we need something to shake both the region, but more importantly, the international community out of its stupor. Uh, you know, where are the Europeans on this issue? Where is the broader international community? Without that kind of pressure, it's just the US and its puppet allies yelling at China. That's the way Beijing's gonna pitch it. And that is not the kind of normative pressure that's gonna make any change in Chinese decision making. Greg, I think that's a very excellent point to end on. Thank you so much for taking the time and for being so articulate and knowledgeable on, on a subject that is you know, of endless fascination to all of us. And of course, of tremendous political and, and uh, importance, security importance, not only for Southeast Asia, I would argue, but for the larger region. All right, thank you very much. And thank you all of you who joined uh, the webinar. Uh, hope to do this again someday. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Don. Thanks, everybody.